Good morning. Welcome back to Foundations in Faith. A uh, little bit of a side confession, I guess. I always feel like I want to be a, a game show announcer when I welcome you all to today. Good morning. Welcome to Foundations in Faith, where you, yes, you, can win salvation. Yeah, no, okay, terrible. I got that. But I, I never really <laughs> know how to start the videos, so you get what you get, I guess, in that way. But uh, we are continuing on in our study of kind of the foundational beliefs of Christianity and Lutheranism in particular. We've been walking through justification in the last few weeks. Um, we're continuing, actually concluding that discussion today. This is the last little section on justification itself um, that we'll be talking about. We'll move into a new topic next week. But this week is kind of wrapping things up and taking a look at works. What are works? What's the place of works within our Christian life, within our redeemed and justified life? Because last week we talked about how works cannot save us. Works have no meaning apart from Christ. They can't get us justification. They can't get us to God. And so the question then comes up, what is the place of works? Or, to put it another way, what about the scripture passages that speak of works? Now, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession actually brings up these passages, passages like Matthew 19, 17, that says, If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Another way of saying, do these works. Another one would be Romans 2.13. The doers of the law will be justified. So how do we reconcile these two things? We say works cannot save us. That's very clear in what we teach as Lutherans. And yet we have clear passages of Scripture here that are saying, no, 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 you're justified by works. Works save you. Uh, again, Romans, uh, it is the doers of the law who will be justified. And the writers of the Apology go on to say, and many other such passages about the law and about works that speak in this same way. Before we dive into those passages, before we kind of explain all this, I just want to throw out there at the very beginning, this is a valid question. Essentially, it's asking, if works mean nothing for justification, then why do we preach to do good works at all? Isn't it just okay, we have faith, we have justification, now I'm free to do whatever I want. Let's rely on that faith, let's cling to that faith. Awesome, I've been set free from the consequences of my sin, now I can live how I want. And the response to that, as we see and walk through it, is basically that's, that's cheap grace, is what we call it. That denies the true sacrifice of what Christ did on the cross. So as we looked at justification last week, as we looked at the weight of our sin, of original sin, yes, the weight of that broken relationship, but the weight of that sin that we commit on a daily basis that we can continue to commit even after we're justified, the true reality of that sin is the broken relationship with God. And if we say, even after justification, even after I have faith, I'm going to go on and continue to sin, we fail to recognize the true gravity of what sin is. That we're seeking again to break that relationship. That we're trying to break that relationship that Jesus died for on the cross. That we're basically denying that relationship that he invites us into as he calls us his children, as he calls us his people. So this is a very valid topic of discussion. It's something we need to work out. It's something we need to think about as Christians and have a response to. As we say, what is the place of works? And essentially, in a, in a short way to say it, the response to that is we are called to works in the passages listed above as well as other passages. Um, I think of James, uh, the very common passage, faith without works is dead. The response to that is uh, these are only possible, this is only really applicable after the process of justification has happened. And it's not just me saying that, that's what the writers of this book of the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Confession, say as well. And they say, these statements and others like them assert that we ought to begin to keep the law and then keep it more and more. Now, we're not talking about the ceremonies, but about the law which deals with the impulses of the heart, namely the Decalogue, namely, namely those outward good works towards our neighbors, as well as the good works of loving God, of cherishing him above everything else. Because faith truly brings the Holy Spirit and produces a new life in our hearts, it must also produce spiritual impulses in our hearts. Those spiritual impulses then take shape in formation in our lives as good works, as the works of the law. It says, therefore, after we have been justified and reborn by faith, again, first, primary, foremost, is faith. 
justification in faith, after these things, then we begin to fear and love God, to pray for and expect help from Him, to thank and praise Him, to obey Him in our afflictions. We also begin to love our neighbor because our hearts have spiritual and holy impulses. And then as if that weren't clear enough to say justification comes first, he goes on to say these things cannot happen until after we have by faith been justified. So essentially what they're saying is let's get the order of these things correct. And the order goes, first we are sinful fallen people apart from the will of God, apart from a relationship with God. The law shows us our sin. We walked through this a few weeks ago. And that the law is a curb, yes, but it's also a mirror. It shows us our sin. It shows us our need for God, our need for salvation. Faith comes into the scene. Faith justifies us apart from our works. Our works have nothing to do with justification, with salvation. But after we have been saved, after we have been justified, after we have been given new life through Jesus and through his sacrifice... We are then called to continue to keep the law. We are called to continue to do the will of God. So then the question comes, does keeping the law in and of itself make God happy? Is that the point of the law? Okay, you're justified, now keep the law. That's what God wants. No, not necessarily, or not if you put it in those terms exactly. Because if that were the case, then we could be righteous by keeping the law. We could have justification by keeping the law. So it's not just keeping the law. It's not just doing the things God wants us to do that makes him happy. People outside of Christianity can externally do the things the law says to do. They can treat people well. They can uh, treat people with justice and mercy and compassion. They can give to the poor. They can do all these things. And yet they are still in their sin. So it's not just keeping the law that makes God happy, that brings God joy in our lives. Rather, it's being in Christ. First and foremost, it's having faith in him. It's being saved by that faith in him that brings God joy. And then, yes, through that faith, through that salvation, then doing the things God wants us to do, then keeping his law, then living as creatures and living in the way that he has called us to live. And uh, this is spoken in 140 um, of the apology here. Furthermore, We not only teach that the law can be kept, but also in what way it pleases God when we keep any of it. So what does it mean to please God as we keep the law? What is the point of the law for the Christian that has been justified? It's not because we live up to the law, but again, because we are in Christ, first and foremost, because we have that faith. He goes on to say, in fact, we add that it is impossible to separate love for God keeping the law or doing the things God has called us to do from faith. You have to have faith first and then move on to the keeping of the law and then move on to the good works. We can't have it the other way around. So then the question comes up, well, what if I have faith? What if I've been justified? I have this faith. I want to keep the law. I want to do these good works, but I just can't. There's something inside me. There's some sin. There's some addiction. I just cannot shake. The response to that is, whoever doubts the forgiveness of sins insults Christ by thinking that such sin is greater or stronger than the death and promise of Christ. That's a little bit of a harsh way that Melanchthon is coming at it and saying, um, no sin that you have, nothing that you do, nothing that you struggle against is more powerful than the forgiveness that God has won for you through Jesus Christ on the cross. That is a beautiful promise, and that's something that we need to hold on to, as we all do continue to struggle against our fleshly nature, against our sinful nature. Yes, we have this new birth. Yes, we have justification and salvation and new life in Christ. And yet we're very much aware of the sin that is still present in our lives. And as we fight and struggle against that sin, we can't say, I am not worthy. I'm not good enough. I can't shake this sin. God could never love me because of this sin. That's just blanketly not true. No, God loves you so much he sent his son to die for you and to forgive you of all of your sins, even that sin you're continuing to struggle with. And if you deny that Christ has forgiven that sin, you're actually denying the power of Christ on the cross. You're denying his forgiveness. You're denying his love for you. You're placing yourself as a higher authority in your life than God and then Jesus Christ. If Christ has said you are forgiven, then take heart and know you are forgiven indeed. But again, 
we got to keep in mind the order of these things. And they write again, therefore it must be that faith reconciles. Faith first and foremost reconciles us with God. It justifies us. And then, after faith comes, it makes a righteous person out of an unrighteous one. So at the moment of faith, you are declared righteous. You are declared justified in the eyes of God, in the eyes of anything that matters. And then as we live in that justification, as we live out that reconciliation, it comes to fruition in our works, in the things that we do. So it's living in the reality of that forgiveness, living in the reality of that justification. It's living in that reality that Christ is greater than our sin. Christ has defeated all of our sins on the cross. We're called to put off that sin and instead live in a holy manner, live in a justified way, but that in no way negates our standing as justified children of God. So the truth and the reality of what happens in justification is not that our outward actions change. Rather, it's that our entire identity has changed. And if you've heard me preach, if you've heard me on the weekends, uh, hopefully you have. But if not, identity is a really big thing for me. And it's one of the things that I want to key in on, uh, especially within this topic. Uh, so before faith, our identity, whether we knew it or not, is sinful fallen people, broken people, cut off from God himself. We are under the condemnation of the law. We're under the condemnation of death. And at our very core, that's what defined us. Broken people living against God, living in opposition to God. And so, so then after justification and after, our faith, after faith is given to us, our identities are changed. Our core of who we are is changed. We are now redeemed children of God just as we are now redeemed children of God. That's who we are at our very core, and that cannot be changed by our outward actions. So if you think about it in the same way that children in this world, they disobey their fathers. They don't always do the things that they're supposed to do. They're stiff-necked. They're stubborn. They're bullheaded sometimes. We are too. That's the reality of as we struggle against sin and continue to struggle against sin. But being stiff-necked, being bullheaded, all those things, it doesn't change our identity. In the same way that a child who misbehaves, it doesn't change their identity from no longer a child of that person. Even as we sin and continue to struggle against sin in our lives, it doesn't change our identity. It doesn't change the core of who we are, that God loves us, that we are his children. So our status as justified children of God is not dependent on our works, but our works are dependent on our status as justified. Another way of saying, good works don't get us justification, but through justification, we are now enabled to do good works uh, out of love, out of respect, out of thankfulness for the things that God has done for us, for the way that he has worked within our lives. So what this really gets down to, what this really speaks about is the third use of the law. And again, if you remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about those three uses. This now is the third use. So justification, faith have come into our lives. They have changed our identity. We are now redeemed children of the of redeemed children of God. Excuse me. But the law is still God's good and perfect will for His creation. So what role does that play in our lives? The law no longer condemns us. We have justification. We have salvation. So it can't condemn us. It can't convict us of death. It can't tell us we're going to die because of our sin but it still shows us the will of God for our lives. So this is where the third function comes in. As redeemed and justified children of God, we actively seek to live in his will, not in our own. We actively seek to do the things of the Spirit of God, to do the things that he wants us to do, rather than to do the things of our flesh, to do the things that we did beforehand. So the law tells us that will. It tells us the will of God. And it's a long book. Uh, it's a long book, the Old Testament. There's a lot of laws within it. Uh, thanks be to God, Jesus summarized it. Love God and love your neighbor. That's the will of God. That's what produces good works in our lives. Love God first and foremost. Keep him as number one in our lives. Keep him in the proper place in our lives. But then also to love our neighbor. Love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So then the question comes up, okay, well, God has gifted me in certain ways. I'm really good at praying, or I'm really good at giving, or I'm really good at uh, being an emotional support. But what if a need comes up 
that I just don't want to fulfill, that I don't feel gifted in a certain way to fulfill. And I have a, a professor at the seminary who used to say, I don't really care your motivation for doing a good work. I don't really care your motivation for keeping the will of God as a redeemed child of God. If, the, if God has placed that person in your life, if God has placed that situation in your life, that you can step towards them, that you can share the gospel, that you can show the love of God to them in any way, shape, or form, even if you're not gifted in that way, then you are called to step towards them and act in that way, to do the will of God in their lives, to show them that love, to do a good work for them. So it's not necessarily the motivation for a good work that makes it a good work, that makes it the keeping of the law. Rather, it's, it's the knowledge of God has placed this person in my life. God has placed this situation in my life. He has called me to live in a certain way, even if I really don't feel like it, even if I really don't think I'm good enough for it, even if I don't think I've been gifted in that way. That's our old nature. That's our sinful nature trying to pull us away from God again. And the professor would say, you just need to go and do that thing. Just go live in that will of God. Just go serve your neighbor in whatever way they need to be served, whether or not you feel like it, whether or not you have the correct motivation. Because in that way, you're still keeping the law. You're still serving your neighbor. And ultimately, as you dig down and as you look at these things and get into the core of why you're doing it, yeah, you might not want to. Yeah, it might be out of duty or obligation that you feel you need to serve. But where does that duty and that obligation come from? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what God has done in your life, thanksgiving for what Jesus has done in your life, the forgiveness that you've been giving, and a willingness to share that forgiveness and live in that forgiveness uh, with the people around you and with your neighbor. So all of this to say works are important. Works are a fruit of the justification that we've been given. We talk about the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. A lot of these are works, things that we do towards other people but they do not save us. Works are not what save us. They are what show the love of God active in our lives that has changed us, but also shows that love to our neighbor. This is summarized really well in some of the closing sentences here in the Apology. For far above our purity, indeed far above the law, ought to be placed the death and satisfaction of Christ, which have been given to us, that we may realize that we have a gracious God on account of his satisfaction, and not account on, of our fulfillment of the law. Again, saying it's not our works that save, rather it's God's love and God's sacrifice through Jesus Christ that save. Trust is ungodly when placed in our fulfilling of the law. So whatever works you think you're doing, if you put your trust in those works, rather than what Christ has done for you, it is ungodly. You're placing yourself, again, over and above Christ in your life. However, he's quick to say in this section, however, that trust which is placed in the satisfaction of Christ is necessary. It's necessary to have that trust in Christ. And then it's also necessary to live out that trust in the things that we do for other people, in the things that we do in their lives, in the good works that we do. So just another summary. This is from not the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, but the original article of the Augsburg Confession. It's taught that such faith should yield good fruit and good works, that a person must do such good works as God has commanded for God's sake, but not place trust in them, as if thereby to earn grace before God. For we receive forgiveness of sins and righteousness through faith in Christ. And then he goes back and, and speaks about the early church fathers too, and saying, the fathers also teach the same thing. For Ambrose says, it is determined by God that whoever believes in Christ shall be saved and have forgiveness of sins, not through works, but through faith alone, without merit. So works are important. Works are good things that we have to do. Scripture calls us to good works. Again, you think of James, faith without works is dead. But what's first? Faith. Keep the first things first. Keep things in order. Faith comes first. We are justified by faith alone, by grace alone, through the love of God. But as we're changed, as we're justified, as we are redeemed through that faith, good works then are the natural outflow of that justification, the natural outflow of that salvation as it's worked out in our lives, as that salvation manifests itself in the things that we do. So that's a real quick discussion about what place works has in our lives as 
Christians, as Lutherans, I would love to interact with you. I would love to hear your feedback on this. I would love to have questions and be able to answer those questions. If you have any of those, you can always comment down below on this YouTube video. Uh, leave a quick comment down there, and I'll be checking and interacting that way. You can also email me, Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com. It's Pastor Andrew at stpaulboca.com. I'd be happy to answer any email, emails and engage in conversation in that way as well. Next week, um, we're digging into a new topic, talking about the church, uh, talking about what the church is, what makes up the church, all those good things. Uh, particularly applicable as we walk through this time of pandemic, this time of not being able to meet together. Is the church just a building? Is the church the people? How does this play out? What is the church? The church visible, the church invisible. We'll get into all of these things starting next week. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful week, a blessed week. We'll see you later.